What is up, Bitcoiners? This is your boy CK, and this is another episode of the Bitcoin Magazine podcast. This week, I sit down with Steve Schnall, the CEO and founder of Quantic Bank. Quantic Bank is a bank that is focused on banking the underbanked, and they made ripples in the last few weeks with their brand new Bitcoin backed debit card. Uh, Quantic is not in the Bitcoin space, and they are launching a Bitcoin product because there's so much demand. And when I spoke to Steve about why Bitcoin, he had some great answers. He understands what's happening in the macro. He's actually been in Bitcoin and in the cryptocurrency space since Mt. Gox and uh, had some really great insights here about how the greater market is thinking about Bitcoin and why Quantic is rolling out Bitcoin services uh, to their normal everyday customers. So you guys, without further ado, let's talk about our sponsors. Stacks 2.0. No, they're no longer block stacks. They, it's now the Stacks 2.0 blockchain. And they're really orienting around Bitcoin, right? So the whole idea is it's a blockchain. They have a proof of transfer, POX, uh, and you peg in Bitcoin. And Bitcoin is the money on the blockchain. Uh, they also have a you know governance and staking token to support that blockchain STX, um, but you don't need that token to use the blockchain. And that blockchain it, it takes on a lot of the features that um, you know you can't build directly into the Bitcoin blockchain. Things that other altcoin chains are trying to do, um, and it brings it to a Bitcoin denominated world. So I think that the world is going to start denominating in Bitcoin, and the closer and more trustless you can get to using Bitcoin, the, the more people are going to want to use those applications. So it's exciting to see what um, what Blockstacks is doing here and them committing to Bitcoin. We're starting to really see the narrative of Bitcoin, not blockchain. Like their, their marketing, their branding is all about, we are part of Bitcoin. Uh, we're leveraging the most important and the, the most prevalent blockchain and Bitcoin is money on our blockchain. So I like that, that, uh, that turn of directions. Go check out Stacks 2. Dot com so that's s t a c k s two the number two dot com and uh, learn more if you're especially if you're a developer uh, but if you want to just poke around and see their uh, blockchain based decentralized apps and DeFi stuff uh, again they're doing that all uh, on the Stacks two blockchain and that is enough from me let's jump right into this podcast with Stephen Schnall. Welcome, Steve, to the Bitcoin Magazine podcast. I'm super excited to have you here and to dive into your history and Quantic Bank. Um, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks a lot. I appreciate the opportunity to be here and uh, looking forward to sharing our story. So I guess, you know, it, just to start off, like, you know, who is, you know, Stephen Schnall and, uh, you know, what is Quantic Bank? All right. Well, um, Let's see, uh, career spent in finance, mostly mortgage finance. I live in New York City, got a wife and a couple of teenage sons. And um, so a little background, uh, I had I had run a mortgage company that I founded, you know, one-man shop in, uh, in the 90s, built it to about a thousand-person company, ended up forming a mortgage read, taking the whole thing public, and uh, ultimately selling it in 2007, just ahead of the credit crisis. And... Um, you know, shortly thereafter, we had this whole you know credit bubble, economic meltdown, and uh, one of the byproducts of that was that a lot of um, creditworthy Americans, you know, would-be homeowners, were having a difficult time obtaining home loan financing due to some of the, le- the legislation stemming from Dodd Frank, and so I saw an opportunity to re-engage in the lending world, but to do so as a bank this time around rather than a mortgage company because as a bank, we would have the opportunity to use our balance sheet to make loans and serve mostly underbanked borrowers, small business owners, immigrants, gig economy workers, and the like. And so we went out and looked for a bank to buy. We found a tiny little beat up bank on Long Island, New York, acquired it, recapitalized it, rebranded it as Quantic, moved it to New York City, and uh, and set out to essentially start lending to uh, underbanked uh, home buyers. And uh, along the way, we discovered that the U.S. Treasury has something called the CDFI designation, which is Community Development Financial Institution. And that because we were focused so much on lending to low income people, that we were eligible to become certified as a a U.S. Treasury CDFI, which we now are. And so we're a mission oriented bank that really focuses 
on serving the underbanked and lending, you know, in low income census tracts to, um, you know, black and minority communities and, and primarily to low income households. So we, um, we set out to build this lending business and um, as a bank, in order to lend, you need deposits. And one of the things we didn't do a good job of early on was building a retail deposit franchise. You know, my view in uh, 2009 when I bought the bank was that brick and mortar bank branches were gonna become a thing of the past. And so we didn't run out to open more branches. Instead, our view was we could build a deposit franchise online. And um, we were probably a little early in that view and it didn't go well uh, for a handful of years. It was slow growth, but ultimately we got some regulatory pressure to really be able to bring in retail deposits online because we weren't opening branches. And so we really had to brainstorm and figure out what kind of deposit products could you build that would appeal to a wide array of customers. But it also had to be something that, you know, for me, at least as an entrepreneur was interesting and exciting and current and relevant. And uh, I love Bitcoin. I've been a crypto enthusiast, you know, kind of since the beginning. Uh, I have a sad story. I bought my first Bitcoins at $75 and had them at Mt. Gox in Tokyo. Oh, and I know you know what happened with Mt. Gox. So I lost um, a, a, a literal fortune of Bitcoin by, by the hack there, which does also shape some of my views on some of the things that are happening in the custodian world of, of crypto today. But um, a friend of mine and I, who I ended up hiring to come into the bank as our chief uh, innovation officer, uh, he and I started out in crypto by, um, by buying a bunch of video cards and building a bunch of rigs to mine for Ethereum. And, uh, and we had a good run at that. What year was that? Just for context. Uh, oh, that would have been about three years ago. So Ethereum okay. was at around $800. So uh, you, you had coins on Mt. Gox. You're mining Ethereum three years ago. All right, continue. I'm starting to see where this podcast is going to go. <laughs> yeah, so... Um, the cool thing was uh, my friend Patrick, he, uh, before he shut down his digital marketing company and joined Quantic, uh, he had an office in Indianapolis. And it was a class B office building where the electric wasn't submetered. And so electricity was included in his rent. So you know where I'm going with this. So uh, we decided, well, let's just load up his office with a bunch of rigs and start and start mining. Uh, which we did. Ultimately, when he shut down his office to come join me, we had to dismantle all the rigs and, and they remain dismantled today, sadly, because uh, you know now that Ethereum is back up over a thousand, I had wished I'd been mining it all along. Um, but anyway, so as he and I started to um, just kind of imagine here, what, you know, what can we do in a bank around Bitcoin that uh, wouldn't run afoul of you know, the regulators and all of the you know, the lack of regulatory clarity as to what banks could or couldn't do. We did know that banks can't own Bitcoin or couldn't at the time. It's still unclear whether they can now, although the OCC has come out and said banks can custody Bitcoin, which isn't the same as ownership. So we said, hey, um, why don't we come up with a product that rewards people for using our checking account and reward them in Bitcoin? And so a rewards card isn't unique or novel. There've been rewards cards forever where people can earn cash back or membership miles or airline points, that kind of thing. But we said, hey, every time a customer uses our debit card, we, we earn interchange. Why don't we take that interchange and say to the customer, use our debit card and we'll use that interchange to buy and give you Bitcoin as, uh, as an award or reward for using our, our, our checking account. And so the first thing we did was we conferred with council and the conclusion was we need to get regulatory approval to do this. That was about a two year process. And ultimately uh, the OCC, the Office of Comptroller of Currency, our regulator finally came around and said they, um, you know, they're okay with this. And that was probably accelerated a little bit by Brian Brooks joining the OCC as the comptroller. He comes out of Coinbase and is kind of a crypto enthusiast from what I can gather. And, um, yep. He just yeah, recently right. published a pretty big blog post about DeFi. Yeah, yeah, I haven't seen it, but I heard about it. It's on my reading list. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like an enthusiast to me. Yeah, for sure. And, uh, so uh, we've been working on launching this, on developing this product. And one of the things that was critical to the success of the product was to be able to have a partner where we could acquire the Bitcoin and custody the Bitcoin for our customers uh, safely. You know, with my background in being hacked once, you know, I couldn't see an environment where we could ever subject our customers to that. 
So we ended up partnering with a firm called NYDIG, which um, I think is hands down the most sophisticated uh, crypto custodian in the market right now. And they've got you know, their own plans around some things they're going to do to help banks get further into, uh, into the digital asset space and cryptocurrency. But so we've been co-developing this product with NYDIG and we developed a partnership where um, you know, our customers will use our debit card, earn Bitcoin points, and then we'll take the funds that we earn in interchange, remit them over to NYDIG, NYDIG will acquire the Bitcoin and that Bitcoin will be deposited into our customers' accounts. And so we just launched this um, two weeks ago and uh, we're off to a great start. And we haven't really started marketing it yet. We got a fair amount of PR around the launch which has resulted in a number of accounts coming in. But right now we're in the, um, just working out the kinks, making sure the customer experience is everything we want it to be, making sure that we've got all of the FAQs lined up because people have a lot of questions about Bitcoin uh, and around the program. And so we're working through all of that now and we expect to start marketing for it in earnest in the next couple of months and really blow it up. That's awesome. Well, I mean, like I said, Bitcoiners get excited when they see um, companies outside of Bitcoin um, building Bitcoin products. So um, I guess it, it, it makes sense that you are a long time into Bitcoin and personally like in, in, in an early adopter, uh, which is very exciting. It also makes a lot of sense because you're trying to help bank the unbanked, right? And that is kind of something that's core to Bitcoin's philosophy as well. So uh, all the, the stars seem to be aligning here. Can you, can you talk a little bit like zooming out, like where, where are there like, like holes and issues in the current financial infrastructure? And, you know, I guess, where do you kind of see um, companies like Quantic as well as, you know, cryptocurrency and Bitcoin, you know, filling in those gaps? Well, there's a lot of innovation that's occurring in the banking and crypto space. A lot of it's being filled in by fintechs. And then there are also a number of banks moving into the space. So they're kind of two broad categories, the way I see it. Number one is, um, just facilitating the, the procurement and custody of Bitcoin for customers. And, you know, we've seen uh, or heard of surveys where, you know, like, I guess 10% of consumers own Bitcoin now, but in the surveys we've done, a very high percentage of customer people would like to own Bitcoin, but some people are still scared of it. They don't understand it. There's volatility around it. It's too risky. They don't know where to buy it, how to hold it. They're afraid of losing their key. You know, you keep hearing all these stories. So yep. the surveys we've done um, showed us that if, if you, a bank would be involved, it adds a layer of safety and credibility, even though crypto is not FDIC insured by any means, at least they know they have a regulated partner that's helping them to transact. So I think in addition to the Bitcoin rewards program that we launched, you're going to start to see banks act as an on-ramp for people to be able to purchase Bitcoin and own Bitcoin. And you know, maybe banks will use partners like NYDIG or maybe some banks will decide to take that effort on themselves. But I think that the consumer would be far more comfortable owning Bitcoin if they can acquire it through a bank. And when that happens, and we expect to be on the front of that curve, when that happens, I think you're gonna see a far greater consumer adoption of Bitcoin. So that's Bitcoin as really an asset class, a store of wealth, uh, a hedge against a potentially devaluing dollar. Uh, you know, you've got a lot of new money being pumped into circulation by the government now, and that typically doesn't bode well for our currency. And so, you know, we think of it as a means by which we can help people amass or preserve wealth by introducing them to Bitcoin. On the other column, you have um, how blockchain and crypto in general can help facilitate uh, digital commerce you know, international money transfers, very cumbersome over the traditional bank rails, lots of friction, lots of time, lots of cost. So the OCC came out and said, hey, banks uh, can use stable coins now to facilitate things like this and banks can use blockchain. And so um, the, the regulators have really embraced the fact that the blockchain is not a fad, it's something that's here to stay, that it does have the the, 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 um, the characteristics that lend itself towards safety with you know, the distributed ledger, the immutable aspect of it, and the fact that it provides for real-time frictionless, low-cost ability to transact. And so the possibilities are, are really limitless with respect to um, what banks and fintechs will do to innovate the way payments work, the way ledgering of lending works. There's, kind of an unlimited spectrum of what can happen with the blockchain. And so we're really just in the first inning of this, I think. And, uh, you know, the story's not been written yet. 
Yeah. So I guess honing in on Bitcoin specifically, um, it sounds like you're getting some strong market signals that people are interested in Bitcoin, right? And uh, the dollar, you know, the narrative has kind of turned against it to some degree, maybe all fiats. Um, you know, how important is Bitcoin going to be for an everyday consumer's life moving forward? I'm kind of curious where your vision is there. Well, there, there are conflicting views on this. Um, I, I personally believe that it'll be some time before Bitcoin becomes this ubiquitous form of payment where a customer can go in and just buy stuff with Bitcoin. Um, I think in the near term, people will start to view Bitcoin as an alternative to gold where you know, if uh, you want to diversify some percentage of your assets into something that is a true store of value that's a hedge against inflation and things like that, uh, Bitcoin is probably the perfect vehicle for it. Obviously, anybody who understands Bitcoin gets that the, you know, the salient feature is that there's a finite supply. And so it can't be inflated and devalued. It's purely going to be priced based upon a function of supply and demand. And the more people that want it, the more the value will go up, or at least the less volatile the valuations will become. So uh, Bitcoin as an asset class, I think, is a home run for the consumer. You're also starting to see a lot of institutional money allocate certain portions of their liquid reserves to Bitcoin. Uh, you saw a couple of weeks ago, Mass Mutual put $100 million into Bitcoin. And while that's a very small percentage of their net worth, it is symbolic of, I think, what's about to become a much larger trend. Whether or not people will use Bitcoin um, as a means of commerce to be determined, there are some impediments to it. As you know, the, the blockchain has limitations. If 6 billion people were transacting in Bitcoin all at the same time, you know, I don't think Bitcoin can um, accommodate that kind of volume and traffic today. And I don't know what, how it will evolve or what will happen to make that so. But um, also, if you, if you own Bitcoin and you wanna spend your Bitcoin, it's potential that it's potential it has the potential that every time you spend it, you're going to incur a taxable gain. You know, if you bought Bitcoin at, it's hard to fathom. I'm saying numbers like thirty thousand, uh, and then it goes to forty, and you spend some of it. Well, now you just you know you spent ten dollars and you have a you know a four dollar three dollar gain or whatever the case may be. So um, there's that's that adds some friction to it and and takes away I think some of the desirability of using it for commerce, but. Um, I'm fully prepared to be wrong on this, and and uh, it may in fact evolve to the point where people are actually spending Bitcoin. And you're seeing, you know, Visa and some of the other big fintechs trying to uh, create a world where they can facilitate spending the Bitcoin. But the reality is, even if you spend get Bitcoin, you're not spending Bitcoin. You're you're liquidating Bitcoin and spending fiat. And until merchants all over the world are willing to take Bitcoin uh, as their means of payment, then you're really not going to be transacting in Bitcoin. Yeah, well, I, I very much agree with all of that analysis. And it's going to come from the merchants, right? The merchants must demand Bitcoin. It's not going to be consumers demanding to pay in Bitcoin unless, I mean, and th there are kind of like workaround solutions for people who want to bank on Bitcoin and use gift cards or something else, some sort of alternative uh, in order to kind of access the fiat world. But yeah, I think you're completely right there. And uh, one thing I'm interested in picking your brain on is like the evolution of a Bitcoin buyer, right? You've been there since the Gox, day, the Gox days. Like that was a very unique type of a person, cypherpunk, nerd, uh, programmer, maybe a, a, a someone who's in finance like yourself, um, but not a typical consumer, not an institution. Um, but now we're seeing, you know, the archetype of a Bitcoin buyer change a lot. Can you kind of talk about that evolution since you've been in Bitcoin and, you know, maybe how you see that affecting the Bitcoin market moving forward? Well, you're right. I mean, originally it was uh, hackers and geeks and, you know, people who just uh, thought it was a, a cool new thing. Um, but the trend now is, you know, you're seeing, like I said, institutional uh, entities buy Bitcoin in large scale as, as a hedge or a store of wealth. The, the consumer, um, you know, has been the, the everyday consumer, the, you know, the, the middle-aged person, housewife, so to speak, you know, they, um, they're slow to the game. But I think that once 
your bank or Fidelity or you know pick your brokerage firm once they start to offer owning Bitcoin as a as an asset class in addition to stocks and bonds and your traditional investments, you'll start to see more and more people uh, want to own it and engage. Um, also, the more news it gets, the the better it is for people. And of course, you know you're playing on volatility, but Bitcoin hits twenty thousand and then thirty, and all of a sudden the media starts talking about it, and you start to see consumers saying, "Hey, from a speculative standpoint, I want into this party." And so that'll start to drive a lot of people in. And so you know all all of it put together, merchants accepting Bitcoin, consumers wanting to ride what they believe to be an upward trajectory to increase wealth, institutional investors, looking to diversify or have a store of wealth. Maybe uh, someday you'll see govern governments allocating small portions of government reserve currencies to, to Bitcoin. Um, you know, all of these things put together will continue to add um, to the consumer demand equation. But I think before consumers adopted a mass, most probably want to see some stability in it because it's really hard to take your hard earned savings and money and put it in something that can drop 50% overnight. And um, the more, I think the more and more large buyers of Bitcoin that come into the marketplace, that'll add, A, you need more owners and you need fewer you know, um, speculators, more owners who are owning it to hold, uh, which is also runs counter to whether or not this will ever be used for commerce, uh, but more so as a, as a means of um, wealth preservation. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm all right with wealth pre preservation as a use case. That is a massive, massive market, and people spend millions of dollars uh, to preserve their wealth. So I think that there's a, a pretty big opportunity there. Um, can you talk about a little bit about like from a Bitcoin perspective, what's next for Quantic? You mentioned you know you think that uh, retail banks will start enabling their customers to get more direct access to Bitcoin. Is that something that you are you're eyeing here? Well, the the um, the mobile app that we're building currently will, and we hope to launch it by the end of next quarter, will enable our customers to sell their Bitcoin right from their mobile app. The next step of that would ideally be to enable customers to buy Bitcoin from their mobile app. So we're not we're not operating as an exchange, um, nor a custodian, but really just providing an on ramp for our customers to be able to buy and sell Bitcoin elsewhere, but yet maybe view it through their mobile app. So that if you wanna buy Bitcoin, you can log into your mobile app and say, hey, let's allocate this many dollars to purchasing Bitcoin, and then we'll help facilitate the transaction elsewhere while not actually effectuating the transaction ourselves. So we don't have the, the regulatory risks associated with actually being an exchange and custodying Bitcoin. I think yeah. my suspicion is you're gonna see that um, happen on a pretty large scale uh, eventually, if not in the near term. Yeah, I mean, uh, and I know we don't like predictions, but like, what's the kind of time scale that you're thinking? Are you thinking like two years, five years, 10 years or longer than that? We hope to be able to get there sooner than that. Well, I mean, in terms of like the industry, I'm sure you're trying to ship, you know, very it, quickly it, here. It's moving fast. And, and what, what we're seeing now, interestingly, is the banks are chasing the fintechs. Because the fintechs, uh, they, you know, they're chipping away at bank products and services every day, and starting to disintermediate what traditional banking used to be. So, if the banks want to compete and preserve their customer base, they're going to have to start offering some of these things that uh, that look more, you know, blockchainy, crypto-y, fintechy. So, Makes sense. I, yeah. Um, how much does you know? Square, you know, re reporting massive profits from Bitcoin. PayPal jumping on Michael Saylor. Like, how much does that kind of affect uh, the de-risking of Bitcoin and the the profit opportunity there? Well, it's hard to ignore. Um, you, know, you read Square's earnings releases and see how much money they've earned by you know enabling the purchasing and selling of Bitcoin. And again, you know, you're going to have more traditional institutions wake up and say, "Hey, we we want some of this action as well. We don't want to lose our customers to these non-banks." Who are starting to take take on you know not you, you've got all the peer to peer payments happening outside of the banks now you have the buying and selling of crypto happening outside of the banks so uh, banks like I think we're an early mover we're certainly not alone there are you know only still a handful of banks that are engaging in crypto in any way shape or form but we're a small bank and we think we're what we're doing is really exciting and innovating and we're certainly uh, very visible in the industry as a result of what we're doing and. Uh, I can't imagine it doesn't become more widespread pretty quickly. 
Sorry, I was muted. This is my last question for you, uh, Steve. Um, do you have any opinions on like Bitcoin fundamentals, like uh, things like the having and stuff like that? Does that mean anything to you? And do you believe in like the Bitcoin hype cycle um, that we've kind of seen uh, play out um, in four year increments over the past few years? So um, the good news is, you know, I, I, I can't say that I am intimately technically familiar with how that all works, but the good news is you don't have to be. Um, so I don't have a, you know, a really well-founded view on that. All I know is fundamentally, I like the asset class. Yeah. It just, it gets, you understand that it's getting scarcer and, uh, and yes. number go harder, harder to mine, uh, and all that, but you know, it would have 18 and a half million Bitcoin mines so far. So we're, you know, still several years to get to the, to the end, but the scarcity value is the obvious value prop here. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, outside of scarcity, is there any narrative that you think is like the number one most powerful narrative for Bitcoin? Well, timing is everything. Today, uh, you know, I read something like 30% of all of the US dollars in circulation were created in the last two years, which is just a staggering statistic at how fast the money supply is increasing. And if you study your history, you'll see that anytime anywhere in the world that money supplies have increased so rapidly, the, do the currency is collapsed. And so I'm not saying the US dollar is going to collapse, but certainly there's going to be some pressure here. And for my money, I'd rather hedge that with Bitcoin than anything else. And I think that people are starting to see the same thing. You, whether you're a crypto enthusiast or not, you have to look at what's going on in the macroeconomic picture and say there's absolute systemic risk here. What's going on doesn't seem sustainable. You can't have printing and printing of dollars without there being some consequence. And so, you know, whether you take 2% of your liquid assets or 10 or whatever number you're comfortable with, I think that everybody's going to wake up and start seeing Bitcoin as probably the most ideal hedge against what's going on today. Wow. All right. Well, I think that's a great spot to end the podcast. Uh, Steve, thank you so much for coming on to the show. Um, I think there's a good time to give you a moment to kind of give a last word uh, to our audience, to the Bitcoiners out there. Um, you know, what can you leave them with? Um, I guess the, 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 my final thought would be, obviously, Bitcoin is super volatile. We've had a couple of really rough days over the last couple of days. But um, if you follow it since the beginning, despite the volatility, it still seems to be a strong performer relative to other investments. So, um, you know, just uh, hunker down and be patient and uh, don't puke it up on a dip. And if you're looking to, uh, to earn Bitcoin without risking your own money, Quantix Bitcoin Rewards checking account is a great way to do that. <laughs> Couldn't help it. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. And I mean, again, I support any company that, you know, is driving value by enabling Bitcoin and Bitcoin back. Bitcoin as a universal reward point. I think that that is something that people want. So uh, excited to see you jumping into the Bitcoin game and go from a personal enthusiast to, uh, uh, to bringing it as a product to market. Great. Well, I appreciate the kind words and thanks for having me. Absolutely. And a uh, quick shout out to the audience. Make sure to follow me at CK underscore snarks on Twitter. Make sure to follow Bitcoin Magazine at Bitcoin Magazine and all over the internet where we are posting our content. Uh, and to Steve and Quantic, thanks again for joining and excited to have you back on to uh, maybe do some further analysis down the line, see what, how this year plays out. I look forward to it. All right. Cheers. Cheers.